Okay, so welcome everyone to the ICTS string seminar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, Guy Pimentel, who will tell us about deco decoding and bootstrapping primordial fluctuations. So please take it away. All right, thanks. It's, uh, it's actually a, quite a pleasure to be giving this talk at ICTS because um, uh, the one of the first few steps uh, towards these, uh, this current program of trying to bootstrap the primordial fluctuations was described in a series of lectures that Nima Arkani Hamed gave, uh, uh, I think right before the pandemic in January 2018. So I'll, if you follow those lectures, uh, the beginning of this talk might uh, look familiar, but hopefully I'll make, uh, I'll give a different angle and I'll describe quite a lot of uh, new progress that we've made since then. So the idea is to try to, the, the goal of this talk is to try to give you a flavor of our current understanding, theoretical understanding of the statistics of primordial fluctuations, the fluctuations that source and seed all the structure that we see in the sky and uh, they're an important part of the standard cosmological model. So the lambda CDM model has essentially three ingredients. It has like a matter in the form of cold, dark matter and ordinary baryonic matter. It has a dark energy uh, and it has initial conditions. So it has like a small seeds around which uh, matter clumps and uh, form structure. And the way we probe these uh, ingredients is through the statistical distribution of stuff in the sky. And our main probes at the moment are the distribution of, temp of temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. So here I'm showing you a timeline of the universe. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, this thing doesn't have like a pointer uh, feature. But in any case, so, so th this is a timeline of the universe. And here we are, us, observing our past uh, light cone. There's stuff coming to us. And uh, we can observe light from the cosmic microwave background. And it has small fluctuations. So the, it's, the temperature is not exactly uniform. And you can plot. Uh, here, I'm showing you the plot you can plot um, the distribution of hot and cold spots uh, or the statistics of this distribution as a function of separation. Uh, here it's written in multiples, but it doesn't matter. And you see these beautiful bumps, ups and downs, and this gives us information about these uh, constituents of the universe and about the initial conditions. Same thing for the distribution of galaxies uh, or matter in the sky so here is like a large scale structure of the universe same story now the tracer is the distribution of matter so you plot the the correlation function the two point correlation function in this case of uh, matter as a function of separation in the sky this is a wave number so the the physical question is if i have like a clump of galaxies here what's the probability that i find a large clump of galaxies over there as a function of separation in the sky. And again, I get like some interesting curve. Uh, this two point function goes up and then goes down and it has even like some wiggles and so on. So you can read off uh, a lot of beautiful physics of the various constituents of the universe, how they interact with each other from these curves essentially. And if you run the clock backwards to what and used to be called the Big Bang. Now we refer to it as the hot Big Bang, the beginning of uh, standard lambda CDM cosmology. Then we see that we need initial conditions that are actually very simple to explain these, uh, this data. So we need the uh, gravitational potential to be distributed, these primordial seeds to be distributed in a more or less uh, scale, almost scale invariant way, which is what this curve here in the bottom is uh, trying to show you. So on this curve here, I have uh, the two point function of the, of the local, roughly speaking, the local scale factor. So the universe is almost homogeneous. It has this tiny homogeneities 
and this uh, uh, scalar field here is quantifying uh, how much how much bigger the scale factor is locally and if you were scaling variants i'm multiplying by k cubed here to um, take into account uh, you know some some trivial some trivial scaling that you would get if you were scaling variants if you were exactly scaling variant this curve would be essentially like parallel to the x axis so it has some tiny inclination which means that there is a tendency for uh, the gravitational potential to deposit slightly less power at short scales compared to large scales. And uh, yeah, so this has been measured with uh, high significance also. So this is what we know from observations. And then of course, uh, there's the puzzle of how come you have correlations over long distances uh, imprinted right at the hot big bang. And, we have a paradigm that explains where these come from, and this is what I'm going to focus on uh, in the talk. So just to show that this is observational science, we observe these things and we infer these uh, numbers, and I'm, I'm going to try to explain where it comes from and uh, how we can learn more about this um, period that sources the fluctuation. So we postulate that before the Big Bang, there was an earlier era in which the universe undergoes exponentially growing expansion, the call inflation. For most practical purposes during this talk, I will assume that inflation is uh, very similar, almost identical to some de Sitter phase of the universe to exploit all the isometries of the Sitter space. And the idea is that uh, during uh, the Sitter phase, there is spontaneous particle production because of the time dependent background. And essentially these, uh, these primordial seeds are coming from spontaneous pair production of like some very light scalar field that is active during inflation. Okay. So this uh, arch here is, is just a cartoon of this process of spontaneous pair production. And so it generates like these EPR pairs, if you wish. And it's the same physics of like the Hawking process or the Schwinger pair production. And this is where we think the, these primordial fluctuations come from. And from the data, we can read off just, uh, just two numbers, essentially. We can read off the size of the two-point function. And from the fact that it's not exactly scaling variance, we can tell that this scalar field is very light and very light what does that mean it means light in units of the intrinsic scale of inflation so inflation because it's described by the sitter space it has some intrinsic energy scale the hubble scale during um, inflation so recall that the the scale factor during inflation or, or during the sitter space uh, in the sitter space is given by uh, this exponential function. So this is an, is an unknown, this Hubble scale during inflation, uh, but, but it sets a ruler. So then we can talk about light fields or heavy fields, which is typically not the case in flat space. In flat space, things are either massless or massive, right? And here we can, we just say that the mass of this scalar field, this, uh, let me call it inflaton, which is the typical name. The mass of this inflaton in Hubble units, it has to be much less than one to explain these, um, the, the, the almost scaling variance of this curve here, okay? So this is what we know from the data and this is uh, how we explain it. So we can't observe inflation directly, but we can observe the the statistics of uh, distribution of this uh, primordial scalar imprinted in this uh, um, in this specific time slice, which is you know the beginning of hot hot big bang, hot big bang cosmology, and from that we infer that inflation must have happened. Okay. And uh, okay, this is a paradigm, and then it makes a few predictions, and then I'm going to try to describe how we go beyond the, the most basic predictions. Another basic prediction of this uh, paradigm is that, uh, you know, because 
space-time is evolving and it's a quantum mechanical theory, the metric itself will fluctuate. So there's another fluctuating degree of freedom given by the metric, so which, which means that the graviton itself should, as it's uh, massless, a massless degree of freedom, the graviton itself should leave in print uh, like a two-point function, a non-trivial two-point function. And this is something that people are actively searching for because it's such a robust prediction of inflation. And right now we don't have a detection, but we have some bounds on the size of the graviton two-point function. So just to quote a number, Typically, so the graviton, uh, we typically refer to it as like gamma. And the size of the two-point function of the graviton normalized by the size of the two-point function of the scalar, we refer to it as the tensor to scalar ratio, R. And right now, it's uh, from experiment, we know that it's less than uh, around 10 to the minus 2, give or take, uh, mostly from an experiment called BICEP. Okay, plus maybe joint with other data sets. And uh, actually this number is going to get, we, we're either going to see something and we're going to uh, get better at bounding this number by quite a bit in the near future. So just uh, in particular, there is an experiment that I think is a pretty cool called Lightbird. Uh, the, I think is approved and is, is going to happen by the Japanese Space Agency. And Lightbird plans to either detect or measure R with right, high significance up to order, uh, well, for sure 10 to the minus 3 or maybe some number times 10 to the minus 4, some big-ish number times 10 to the minus 4. So we're going to get better. Uh, by an order of magnitude, which is uh, hard these days in fundamental physics, right? This uh, number, of course, uh, it's an amazing thing because we're measuring gravitational waves of the universe itself, con contouring itself and distorting and expanding, uh, but, but also because we're going to measure the energy scale of inflation. Uh, oh, sorry. It's, uh, My screen is gone. You don't see my screen, do you? No, we don't. Uh, I think the sharing with your iPad has stopped. OK, let's try again. I can try with the physical. Yes. Yeah, if you have a cable, maybe it's, it's more stable. Uh, let's do the cable. Meanwhile, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Um, maybe just a quick question. So, so uh, what what do they do in light belt? Uh, how do they do it? You mean the experiments? Yeah. Ah, it's a it's a light bird is a CMB experiment. It's um. It's a satellite that's going to measure polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And uh, the idea is that when the gravitational waves, um, when the, the gravitational waves, they, they are stretched, right? And then uh, as the universe uh, expansion stops being accelerated, they eventually re-enter our horizon. Um, and uh, when they do, uh, because it's a uh, it's, uh, tidal deformation, it actually decays pretty fast, unlike scalar. So scalar deformations, when they re-enter the horizon, they form like a little potential well, and then stuff clumps around it. But, but now, because it's a gravitational wave, it's some tidal field, and in fact, it doesn't, it's not as good at clumping stuff. So uh, it, the, its power decays away, but, but actually leaves some imprint. It leaves some swirling pattern in the CMB photon. So if you can measure uh, polarization of the CMB very well, then in principle, the signal is there. And, and there, there's a particular polarization feature of uh, the CMB that you can't mimic with primordial scalars. So if you see that, 
uh, then you can claim that it's coming from primordial gravitational waves. But um, of course, uh, I mean, in, 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 in real life, uh, there are other things that mimic the same signal. So famously, BICEP claimed a detection of this uh, two-point function, but it was really coming from uh, dust, intergalactic dust. So, so there are foregrounds that can also mimic this primordial signal, but that's uh, essentially the way that uh, we're hunting for it. So do you see my screen again or? Yes, yes, no, it's good. Okay. Yeah, are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, I forgot to say, you should feel free to interrupt me at any stage. But okay, so if, if we measure anything, then typically H will be huge. Um, H will be, I don't know, like 10 to the, I guess it's model dependent. Of course, you can get away from it, but if you write the simplest models of inflation, then you get maybe 10 to the 13 GeV, which is just to give you like some feel for it. It's around, I think, uh, one or 10 billion times uh 10 to the 9 times lhc energy scale okay so it's an enormous energy scale and then of course then you're tempted this is inflation might be the highest energy scale event in nature and then you can ask yourself can we do particle physics with these events right so all that i described so far is about detecting two point functions which we know if you measure a two-point function, you know very little about the, the external states. You just know its mass and its spin. So that's uh, all we can really tell from measuring two-point functions. We can measure the fact that there is a massless scalar or a very light scalar and that there is a graviton. And of course, graviton has spin too, so that's uh, why uh, we see its imprint through polarization. But can we see more than that? Can we learn about interactions? And this is where, uh, this is where I'm going. So to go beyond the two-point function, we need to measure higher point functions that people call non-Gaussianity, just because it's a process that cannot be described just by the two-point function. So like three and four-point functions, for example. Those are the Those are the first probes of non-Gaussianity, and because these fluctuations are small, in most examples, we think that these are the correlation functions that we have a chance of measuring in the real world. So what do we learn when we measure non-Gaussianity? So for this introductory part, I describe the data and what we want to measure and so on, but then for the rest of the talk, I'll just focus on this, on this part of the diagram. And then late times will be the end of inflation, which means like uh, the beginning of the standard hot peak bank cosmology, okay? So now whenever I draw late times, I mean the beginning of uh, the standard big bang at the, the end of inflation. So here is uh, some late time surface. And what we really observe are um, correlation functions on this surface. So for example, I, have, I can have like a three point function of these uh, scalars, so what physics does it correspond to, or a four-point function? Just, and just because, the, uh, 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 I think there is a, a slight uh, background noise. I mean, we can still hear you, but uh, just uh, there is a little background noise from your side. Uh, maybe I'll put my headphones. I think it's my fan. Just the computer is... Uh... Let's see if it gets better. I think just the computer is uh, warmed up. Just one second. Sorry for the technical issues. Um, can you? Yeah, can you uh, hear me or is it okay or? 
Um, I, I think it's the same as before, but I mean, it was okay. Just, uh, just that there is a small bag on noise. I see. Oh, that's annoying. Sorry. Okay. Well, if if I'm not speaking uh, loud enough, uh, you let me know. All right. So, so we want to. I mean, ideally, if we want to understand the physics of inflation and learn more about like uh, what is this. What is this scalar field, right? There are a million models around for what this scalar field could be. Uh, what UV completes, so, so we, we just measured its two-point function. So what could it possibly be? Could it be like the Higgs particle? Could it be like some composite states? Could it be, could it be like, I don't know, the vibration of a brain? Does it give us an observation, a window into testing string theory in the real world? Uh, I think these are all uh, valid questions and I'll try to argue to you that uh, we need more formalism to even be able to answer this question in principle never mind in practice so okay so what kind of dynamics do we infer from measuring these uh, three and four point functions and then here um, one ex just a couple of examples so if I measure a three-point function you could, for example, measure a self-interaction of this um, of this inflaton field. So you would learn something about uh, the its uh, self-interaction. So, um, I mean, one example is I have the field phi, 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 phi. I could have some effective interaction vertex. That's like I don't know, or phi cubed. As I'll argue in a little bit, is a bad example, but okay, if I cubed, or um, if we go to four points, another self interaction that you could measure. It's probably more realistic, it's something like d phi squared squared, some, some d phi to the fourth, some d phi to the fourth type of interaction. Of course, it's suppressed by a certain scale on the, to the fourth, but okay. So these are the, the so one possibility is just to measure self interactions. And uh, we can already uh, tell a little bit of physics from trying to measure self interactions. So Self-interactions, they occur, uh, um, it's a local interaction vertex, right? So the process can only occur at, at one time during inflation. So then the four or three particles self-interact, and then they get pulled away by the expansion of space-time. But you see, we're only probing one time during inflation. Therefore, all the modes are stretched by uh, roughly the same amount, which means that if I look up in the sky, now I'm trying to correlate certain distances in the sky. So in, in this case here, I would, uh, I'm just looking, I'm just showing the same slice, but the view from above. So I could draw different triangles to try to correlate these three modes. So. I mean, for triangles, we typically um, draw a distinction between a triangle in which one side is much smaller than the others and the triangle that is roughly equilateral. So from this picture, we expect that this type of non-Gaussianity will be such that there will be much more signal in the equilateral limit. Okay? Uh, is that clear? It's just because it's local interaction, then all modes have to be stretched by the same amount. So if there is a hierarchy between the distances that you're probing, it's hard to generate this hierarchy with just local interactions. Because if there's a hierarchy, it means that certain modes were stretched way less than other modes. And you, you don't have the wiggle room to do that. Likewise, in this example of the quadrilateral, you expect that the signal will peak around the square. So if you try to draw like, I don't know, like some kite looking thing uh, where there's a hierarchy, the diagonal is much smaller than the sides, 
then the signal will die off. Okay. So we call this type of uh, signal equilateral non-Gaussianity. Dilemma. When you say right, much greater than you mean that. Uh, uh, I mean, you mean that the equilateral triangle is much greater than a triangle where one of the sides is much smaller. Right? There's no additional parameter that's suppressing it. It's just a. It, it's just that if you take some triangle where one side is parametrically smaller than the other two, then the equilateral is larger than that. That's what you mean, or is there a? Yes, yes, yes. So, so you have um, the three-point function is a shape function that depends on the three sides. Right. And then uh, if you if you make all the sides equal, you have a certain value, the three-point function. And now as you make one of the sides much smaller than the other, the value will be much smaller than right. compared to the size of the, yeah. Right. So maybe the, the more important way of saying it is that if you take the ratio of this shape function for the, for the squeeze triangle compared to the equilateral triangle, that's a number that's much less than one. And is this a precise statement that, you know, the, the signal is actually maximized when at the equilateral triangle, or is it a, yeah. a statement? Uh, actually, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a theorem, but uh, in practice, all these, uh, the moment you move away from the exact, uh, you know, regular polygon, you start losing signal. And uh, as you go to the extreme squeeze limit, then you can read off the, the, the rate at which the signal is decaying. And this rate uh, is determined by the precise interaction. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry. Uh, may I ask a question? Please. So, yeah, I mean, uh, is it also assuming that uh, uh, that the, the spatial expansion are you know same in all the three directions. If I can have a and can have a um, uh, inflation scenario where you know the different spatial directions are expanding with a scale factor like uh, which have a small difference. Uh, right, right. I see what you mean. I think that the the hierarchy between uh, stretched and uh, equilateral will still be there, but maybe now the signal might peak around. Uh, some, I don't know, isosceles. Now, now you break isotropy also, right? So it's not just the shape, but the, but also the, the, the relative orientation. And to be honest, I haven't thought about this uh, scenario in a lot of detail. But I think that the, I mean, the, the picture is really just locality of the interaction plus stretching, right? So I think that that remains the same, but now there will be this additional wrinkle of, uh, of the orientation of the triangle in this part. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Now, um, just to contrast, if I have, now if I have an extra, so remember, I said, so one thing that you could read off is just self-interactions, but now you could have messengers, right? So you could have new states that uh, might be very heavy for our particle physics standards, but remember we have an intrinsic energy scale the Hubble scale during inflation. And uh, heavy is having Hubble units, which uh, I said could be, I don't know, 10 to the 13 GeV, could be enormous. So what if there are other states of mass order Hubble? Maybe we can't observe them directly, but maybe they leave some interesting imprint in the correlation function. And it's, it's a clear, if I describe it for the four-point function, there's a similar story for the three-point function, but I need to relax some symmetry assumptions. So let me describe, let me contrast what happens for this equilateral case to what happens in the case of the four-point function. So if I have a messenger, so now if I have a messenger particle, say I have like two pairs of these scalars that I'm trying to correlate. And then I have some new particle, use different color. some new particle. That actually this particle is first pair produced and then because it's heavy, it decays later into the inflaton. And then we want to understand, now, there, now I can dial the two different time scales because I have the, the heavy messenger around. So this messenger will have a certain mass we call it big M, perhaps, and, and you'll have some spin. So how do we do spectroscopy? So how do we tell the mass and the spin of this, uh, of this new particle? 
And now here, um, again, I think it will always be the case that these, uh, that the square will have more signal than uh, the squeeze shape. But now, as you as you shrink the size of the diagonal, this the the specific spectroscopic details of this new field will will be clear. Okay, so let me try to make that precise. So if I draw a plot of the size of the four-point function, so I'm drawing the four-point function here. Uh, times some uh, some factor here to make the physics more manifest times uh, and here I'm drawing some some figure of shape okay some shape such a way that I start from the quad start from the equilateral limits I start from the square and then as I go in this direction I'm squeezing one of the diagonals okay let's say I do that So I go to this shape. So what am I doing in terms of the physical process? So in these limits, I'm probing physics at, um, let me try to manage the real state. So here in these limits, I'm probing all modes being generated at the same time. So even if it's a heavy messenger, it travels very little. And then this shape will be indistinguishable from this uh, local self-interaction. So if you draw the, the shape, it will start decaying the same way that I expect the local self-interactions will decay as I dial some hierarchy. But now, um, if it were really a local shape, it would die off very fast and it would go to zero, okay? It will go to zero as I go to this uh, squeeze limit. But now, uh, because there's a messenger, I I have more power as I create this uh, hierarchy. So now I can dial, I have the wiggle room to, to probe these two different time scales. So you see, now I have, um, let's call it uh, time one, time two. And these, these two guys here, they get stretched. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I mean, momentum space, that's why it looks awkward. Let's think in position space. So, so these guys here, let me draw it again so that I don't create confusion. Let me draw it again. So the guys on the left, get stretched longer right because they were created earlier during inflation and the guys on the right they get stretched less because they are created later uh, during inflation okay. and and then uh how do i read off the the rate at which power is diminishing what these uh, external red infotons are doing they're really probing the two-point function of this messenger, of this messenger scalar field. So actually, what happens if I compute the signal is I will see that there is more power compared to. Um, so the it will still die off if I go to like a very 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 stretched configuration. But uh, but the rate at which the signal dies off is related to the mass of the messenger, right? So the lighter the messenger, the less its power is red shifted away as space-time expands, okay? And therefore, um, and therefore the, the trends, the particular power that you get as, uh, as you dial these distances in the sky um, will change, okay? So from this power, I can read off the, the mass of the messenger and in fact there is a there is a cool uh, change of behavior here depending on the specific mass of the scalar so there are two uh, there are two distinctive examples 
So there is the mass less than Hubble, mass of this messenger particle less than Hubble. So then you just get a different power law than uh, the self interaction. And then if the if the scalar is a little bit heavier, I'm running out of color. Let me try to pick another one here. Let me pick orange. Now, if the scalar is uh, heavier than Hubble, but not much heavier than Hubble, then actually you even get so you get a different power law, but it's more like an envelope, and you start seeing oscillations. You see a feature. Okay. So the power is related. Yes. So in this argument, did we assume that a particular channel dominates according to the shape of the particle? Yeah, yeah, Be, because yeah, I'm go, I'm uh, just describing the S channel signal. The in the other channels, when you go to this limit, you will be uh, you will have the same behavior as self interactions. It's not efficient at transmitting power uh, in this particular limit because I'm I'm taking particles one and two and singling them out and pulling them very far apart from particles three and four. So I'm on the back of uh, your mind. You should think that I'm selecting the S channel. But of course, in the real signal, you need to sum over all channels. But the qualitative picture is the same. OK. Uh, so, so these wiggles here, uh, they're telling you that this uh, heavy particle is actually travel, traveling a bunch of Hubble volumes during inflation to mediate the interaction. And it's picking up, it's picking up a phase as it goes through the various Hubble volumes. So I think that's a pretty amazing signature of inflation because even though you're probing a static pattern in the sky, the only things you can die are like distances in the sky, you're really reading off this uh, particle traveling through inflation and picking up a phase as it uh, goes through the various Hubble volumes. So, so the wiggles are really related to E to the IMT, if you wish. And then the, the particular power is related to uh, the mass, the mass of the particle in Hubble units. Okay. More uh, precisely, more precisely. Now um, I have. Um, let me go to momentum space because then I can, I can phrase things more precisely. In momentum space, I would have like um, k one, k two. Uh, in analogy with particle physics, I'm going to call this momentum here S because I'm in the S channel. And then I have uh, K3 and K4. And now if I take the limits in which S, if I remove an arrow, it's just notation for taking the absolute value of the momentum. So if I take S to be much less then uh, the ki's, then I'll get s over, uh, for example, s over k1 times k3. I mean, the limits in which k1 is order k2, for example, much less than uh, k3 order k4. And s is much less than all of these. Then the, the signal, the four point function, will have some overall power of S that is just determined by uh, kinematics. But the rate of decay is, uh, question? Sorry, I don't, I don't hear. Is there a question? OK. Um, so the, the particular rate of decay, this power delta, is uh, in ads CFT language is related to the conformal dimension of the mediator scalar. Okay, so this scalar here will have, uh, if I think of it in terms of ads CFT, its mass in Hubble units is given by uh, there is a crucial minus sign delta delta minus three. And uh, this is the smallest delta. 
the one that decays the slowest. Okay, so this is the power that I I will read off from this um, from this curve here. Okay, so that's technically uh, how I read off the the mass of the scalar. What I really read off is the is the conformal dimension of the of the so-called growing mode. Now, how do I read off spin? I don't have the, the extra axis to draw this to you, but you, you can imagine that I have these two triangles here, uh, and I can uh, just now fold one with respect to the other. I drew them in the plane. I can just change the relative orientation of one triangle with respect to the other. And actually, the signal will have another feature. The signal will go up and down. So you can think of uh, uh, each of these uh, pairs here as like two slits in a double slit experiment, two polarizers. So if they are aligned, the signal peaks. And then if there is a relative orientation, the signal will go up and down. And this is how I read off the spin of the mediator particle. Okay. So qualitatively, that's, uh, that's all you need to know about the signal. So that's how we do spectroscopy. That's how we read off the, the features of the, of the resulting shape. Now, uh, how do we actually compute this in detail? This is very similar to what people call uh, Witten diagrams in ADS. But the kinematical variables and the setup uh, is a little bit different in the sitter. And I think actually uh, it's even easier to uh, connect to uh, flat space scattering amplitudes uh, by using the variables that we're used to in cosmology. So in particular, taking the flat space limits and seeing that it's related to some mass channel process or, or self interactions is much easier to see in these variables. So I described the qualitative features, and now uh, I want to tell you about how do we actually compute this, uh, we call the cosmological bootstrap. How do we compute, without doing the time integrals, how do we, from self-consistency, determine this the shape function? So there are two, there are two elements, there's kinematics, and dynamics. Okay. So just to say, state it again, where I'm going, I, I just described the general features qualitatively and the physics behind uh, the measurement of a three and a four point function during, uh, uh, during inflation. And now I want to compute it. In fact, it's, uh, it's a bit holographic, but the reason why we really did it is because it's practically much simpler to think of it in, a, in an own shell way, just trying to anchor yourself to this late time boundary without doing the explicit time integrals for these uh, diagrams, just trying to read off from the real physical observable how you actually compute it. As that's why we call it bootstrap, because we're not doing standard perturbation theory, we're just trying to given some kinematical input and some dynamical input trying to find the shape function. So the kinematics is the kinematics of the sitter space, the de Sitter group, which is SO4,1. Um, but at late times, at late times, this should be very familiar to ADS CFT people. It's um, we have just some um, three-dimensional surface in which the primordial features are deposited. So it's isomorphic to the 3D conformal group, Euclidean. And the uh, EREPs are a little bit funny. They have nothing to do with standard um, unitary EREPs of the conformal group. But they are unitary representations of the De Sitter group. Uh, and, but the kinematics is very powerful. So in particular, it implies a few things. It implies that the three-point function is unique. And uh, in fact, it implies that the four-point function 
at three level comes from unique building block. What do I mean by that? I mean the following. So again, just focusing on the on the S channel. So I described to you this example of uh, of uh, the scalars exchanging a massive spinning particle. It turns out that you can study a much simpler problem, and if you understand this much simpler problem, you understand pretty much everything. The much simpler problem is the following. So it's it's equal to some operator that is largely determined by kinematics applied to another process that's much simpler to study. And in this process, I take um, I will take uh, um, conformally coupled scalars. So now I'm getting a bit technical, but it's just uh, necessary for this part m5 squared equals 2h squared so of course this would decay away but in, in usual ads cft fashion i just read off the leading piece of the correlator when i strip out the the decaying part of the of the correlation function uh, and exchanging a scalar so I, I, I need to study generic scale, generic particle, but but then I, I only study a scalar. M of spin zero. So the claim is that if I understand this process, then I can apply some some operator that is largely determined by kinematics, and I can obtain any realistic correlation function that is useful for the real world and inflation that I can think of for Recall that the mass of the inflaton is almost zero. And uh, here I can do any, well, here the mass is generic, so the mass doesn't change, but I can even spin up. I can get spinning correlators out of this scalar correlator. And in fact, I can even spin up the external legs. So I can use this as a building block to study uh, external gravitons, okay? That, uh, I, 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 I have a question, uh, Yes, yeah, uh, of course. You know, uh, in um, so you know, uh, since this is a theory where gravity is also fluctuating. Yes. Uh, you know, we need some sense, and when we say the symmetry is a SO four one, I'm just wondering if there's a sense in which we can make that precise. I mean, for instance, in ADS, we say that if you go asymptotically far away, yes, you know, the space time is 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 ADS. And here, I mm -hmm. guess we want to say something like if you go to arbitrarily late times, you get these symmetries. But is there a sense in which that can be made precise? I mean, just to say this another way, I mean, there, there's much of this that I guess you could get just by saying that you have some partition function in ADS and then you recrotate it to get a base function in DS. Right? Yes. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if, there, if, you go, if you go beyond tree level, there might actually be some difference that you might need to worry about because of the fact that in DS, the gravitational theory is really dynamical. Uh, I mean, uh, at late times also. So, you know, the metric fluctuates and you may not really be able to treat it as QFT in curve space time at, that, at all orders. Uh, that, that, I think that's certainly something that one should keep in mind. And if, if one just follows a simple minded approach of um, computing these uh, correlation functions, I think you would see a problem in terms of infrared divergences if you, if you started computing, for example, correlators with external gravitons, maybe at loop level. And as you know, there are all sorts of claims that there are infrared effects. I suspect that if these are really uh, significant and physical, you should see the infrared uh, effects when you go beyond three level. I can tell you that at three level, it looks to me, I think we more or less understand almost everything now, and you won't see any of these issues. As you said, you can compute the wave function of the universe in which you freeze the state of the universe at late times, and then there are no issues. And then there's a simple recipe to get the actual correlation function. Right. So I guess that the fluctuations are fairly tame. But presumably, as you go to loop level, uh, you, you could see issues, right? So famously, this is a Starobinsky formalism. 
if I have a, a very light scalar field self interacting uh, and you try to do perturbation theory with loops and so on, you would see infrared effects. But at least in this example of rigid the sitter space, uh, we know that uh, all you're really doing is you're expanding around the wrong saddle. And then if you take into account the new saddle, there's this whole Starobinsky formalism that uh, still will give you the sitter invariant answers. Now, I don't think anyone has done this. Well, as far as I'm aware, nobody has done the same type of calculations with dynamical gravity switched on. And I, I imagine you'll see some hints of uh, the eternal regime of inflation. This uh, time surface would get very bumpy and wiggly. Uh, and I think we're getting close to the point where we have the technical machinery to tackle that problem. I see. But, but uh, I think that for the things that I'm describing here, uh, you won't see any of the things that you're concerned about. Okay, thank you. Uh, so just to reiterate, I think this is an amazing simplification because all possible diagrams uh, in which the Sitter isometries are being linearly realized follow from a unique diagram. So if you understand this diagram here, uh, dynamically, this diagram dynamically, then you understand everything. Uh, everything else uh, uh, follows from some kinematical moves. And if you're an ads CFT specialist, these are called weight shifting. Weight shifting operators. So it's just a machine that if I give you a correlation function of conformal primaries, it uh, produces a new correlation function of conformal primaries of different uh, quantum numbers. So that allows me to change the mass, to change the spin of the various states involved in the process. Uh, but then comes dynamics. Of course, a kinematics at four points is, is certainly not enough. At three points, it's so powerful that it's an exact result even beyond three level. But then comes in uh, the dynamical requirements. And here, uh, the fact that we are working at three level simplifies the dynamics quite a bit. So let me just describe the dynamical uh, singularities of the correlator for contact interactions and then for uh, three level. So for contact interactions, there's only one time at which stuff happens. Right? So there's a unique time. So there should be, in some sense, a unique singularity. There should be only one way of... Uh, uh, singularities are related to something interesting happening. So when you probe a singularity, you should probe something happening in the process. And because there's only one time involved, there should be only one singularity. And, and in fact, if you compute these things in practice, you see that there is only uh, one singularity in this process. So if I have k1, k2, k3, and k4, the momenta, you will see that this four-point function will have a term. If it comes from uh, contact interactions, it will have some numerator that depends on the, mo on the spatial momenta. But importantly, it can only have in the denominator the following combination, k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4. Recall, if I have no arrow, I'm just taking absolute values, k1, absolute value of k1. So because the absolute value involves taking a square root, right? Uh, it means that there is a branch cut. I can change the sheets, move away from the physical region, and then uh, send this combination that I'm going to call e total for more or less obvious reasons. It's the total energy of the process. I'm just summing the absolute values of all the spatial momenta involved in the process. And I can send this to zero. And notice that the process has a, a spatial translation symmetry, right? There's a three-dimensional delta function because the sitter space is a spatial translation invariant, but it's not time translation invariant. When I send the total to zero, I'm, I'm precisely sitting on the support of, of uh, 
on the support of a flat space scattering amplitude. The flat space scattering amplitude has an extra delta function, the delta function of energy conservation. So when I send it total to zero, then this four point function will have a divergence, we'll have one over E total to a certain power. But more importantly, the residue, the residue is a flat space scattering amplitude. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to probe the same process sourced by this interaction vertex, but in flat space. So this is quite a, a stringent requirement on the, on the numerator, actually, because somehow the numerator that depends on these uh, spatial momenta needs to combine into something that is Lorentz invariant. So the three momenta and their absolute values need to combine into something that is writable in terms of four momenta, in terms of Mandelstam's. So this is the only possible singularity of a contact interaction. And when you zoom into the singularity, you get a flat space scattering amplitude. So the physics that you should uh, think of is, of course, I'm, I'm not in the physical sheet because I needed to send this e total to zero. But the idea is that I'm, I'm probing very early times. So I'm zooming into the process. So the modes don't even know that they're in curved space. So what I'm really measuring is a flat space scattering amplitude in this limit. Okay. So can I ask a question, please? Please. So uh, when you take a flat space limit, so the <clears throat> residue, as you say, it's a flat space scattering amplitude, right? So yeah. let's say I'm doing simpler case, which is three point function. Yeah. So I'm spinning correlator. Uh, the flat space amplitudes are written in terms of gauge invariant quantities, right? You can construct a gauge invariant quantity uh and but in the uh, in the ds computation where is the uh, gauge invariance uh, somehow comes into the play um i yeah so in ds uh the three point function can be altered by field redefinitions i guess that that's what you're having in mind but the residue of the singularity will be the same when we do field redefinitions so that that's uh, so th the field definitions do affect the correlation function, but they do not affect the residue of the singularity. So there's no contradiction. I see. So e even though it's a field definition dependent object, uh, the residue is field definition independent. Right. Uh, so so j just to ask, uh, 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 you know, uh, there there are two kinds of amplitude uh, in the three point or in the four point. Uh, one is as you, like uh, minimal coupling, which is like you know, uh, homogeneous versus another is non minimal coupling, which is the non homogeneous kind of thing, right? And uh, non homogeneous things, uh, non minimal coupling thing, they satisfy some kind of what Takasi identity, right? In the yes. But, uh, you know, uh, however, if you take the flat stress limit, those what Takasi identity has to go to zero because uh by because that is basically like the gauge invariance right changing z to z plus k yes so uh that somehow is encoded you, you are saying in the flat space limit that it will turn out to be gauge invariant correct yes that's right yeah when you when you probe this uh flat space limit right so okay so yeah, let's uh, let's describe a specific example. So if I have um, if I have three gravitons, so then there there are two shapes: one coming from um, Einstein gravity, and another coming from some irrelevant operator that involves the the cube of the of the Riemann tensor or the biotensor. Um, now this guy here, um, because well, whatever the coefficient is and Planck squared, it will affect the two-point function. Therefore, I don't have the freedom to dial the overall size of the three-point function. So the overall size of the three-point function for this guy is completely fixed. Well, this one is a free parameter because it doesn't affect the, the, the two-point function. And um, the way you see it uh, is through this word identity that you're describing. Now, uh, that being said, um, this will have some e total to a certain power and this will have e total 
to another power, I think it's uh, power two and power six. Um, and you will read off uh, the three point scattering amplitude in both cases. This you'll read off the scattering amplitude of Einstein gravity, and this will read off the scattering amplitude of this uh, higher curvature term. Now, by going to this flat space limit, I don't think you will be able to tell immediately that the coefficient here cannot be dialed at will, which I think is really is, is your question. So the word identity will tell you that you cannot dial at will okay. this, uh, this term. Right. Uh, but I think that there is no contradiction in the sense that the probe in the total energy singularity tells you that this term is there in principle, but doesn't pin the coefficient. Uh, I'm out of time, right, uh, Victor? You can take a bit more time because there are many questions, so... I'll, I'll just, yeah, so I, I just described the singularities, uh, the, uh, the dynamical singularities of the self-interaction. So I'm just going to describe the singularities of the exchange process, and uh, then I'll wrap up, and then I can tell more if uh, people want to stick around and uh, explain how in detail uh, we compute these things. So, for the exchange, for the exchange process, um, again, there there will be this uh, singularity related to there will be this exchange singularity related to sending the whole process to very early times. So there will be this. I'm going to be very schematic here, okay? This is very impressionistic. It's not at all the real answer, but just bear. It's morally correct. There's a numerator that depends on the momenta. And now the denominator can only have three possible structures. You have E total, which is K1 plus K2 plus K3 plus K4 to a certain power. Which is, and when I zoom into the residue, again, I should get this S channel uh, scattering process. So I should get one over E total to a certain power. And whatever is left here, actually, these things will be inevitable, these other singularities that I'm going to describe to you in a second. Because whatever is left over here needs to combine into one over the Mandelstam S, right? which is a p1 mu plus p2 mu squared, which is the S-channel exchange process. So the, it's, a, it's a tight requirement. Somehow the numerator and the other singularities need to combine in such a way that you get the flat space scattering amplitude. Now, what are the other singularities? Now you have the, the choice of sending either what's happening to the left to, to flat space, in other words, to sending it to very early times, or sending what's happening on the right to very early times. So how do I do that? So on the, on the, the left stuff will be another singularity related to now the combination of the energies that flow, that flow into K1, K2, and this is S. So the energies that flow into this vertex are K1 plus K2 plus S. So now if I send K1 plus K2 plus S to zero, I'm keeping what's happening on the right untouched. But then I'm like probing flat space dynamics of this particular process. So there will be another requirement. There will be another singularity uh, coming from sending K1 plus K2 plus S to zero and the residue so I call this uh, E left, because it's the sum of the energies of the process on the left. And then I should get flat space scattering amplitude on the left times, and this times I'm going to make it like a, a blob because I'm sweeping stuff under the rug, times some three-point cosmological correlator on the right. 
Okay, so I didn't touch what's happening on the right. So there should, I'll have a three point cosmological correlator on the right, but now involving this blue particle. So the blue particle will be here, sigma times the, the two scalar fields, zeta, zeta. Sorry for my bad management of real estate. So, so this is another requirement. So you see this numerator plus the other singularities need to do quite a few jobs. So as I send the total to zero, this, this, uh, sorry, this singularity here, e total to a certain power needs to be such that whatever is left over when I send e total to zero combines into one over flat Mandelstam. Now, when I send e left to zero, whatever is left over needs to combine onto a flat space scattering amplitude on the left and a three point cosmological correlator on the right. And likewise, here I will have a last singularity that will depend on the energies k3 plus k4 plus s to another power and uh, it will have similar structure so it will have here this guy will have one over e right a certain power times cosmological correlator on the left zeta zeta sigma times times scattering amplitude on the right so as you can imagine it's uh, lots of requirements these uh, um, these uh, three point objects are completely pinned by symmetry right because we're in the sitter space uh you can only have these singularities in the denominator and it has to be compatible with all the isometries the resulting four point function so it seems over uh, determined the problem, but in fact it's not, and that's how you find the answer. So then, when you when you ask for a four point function, notice that I didn't talk about time at all here. A four point function that is of this form with all of these um, dynamical requirements, the answer is unique up to normalization, and that's how you classify this answer. Knowing this answer, you can apply this kinematical um, moves here, and you can get whatever you want. And that's how you classify all possible cosmological correlators in inflation, at least under this umbrella of, uh, of exact decider isometries. Okay. So that's, that's more or less what I have. Uh, I can describe, if you want to stick around for longer, how the story gets modified if I have external gravitons, and um, what happens if I relax the sitter isometries? Can we bootstrap like something more like uh, power law cosmologies? And how do I actually solve for this function? In the end, I need to write down some equation that I need to solve, and it's a differential equation, but it's a simple ordinary differential equation that I can solve systematically. Where does this ordinary differential equation comes from, and so on? So this is um, this is what I have. Okay. So just to recap, cosmological correlators are like a fundamental part of primordial cosmology. They give us access to maybe the highest energy event in nature. They are some cool combination of CFT correlators because they are computed in some static uh, three slides, uh, but they encode dynamics of the sitter space. They're in some sense holographic. And they might even give us a real world possibility of probing super high energy scales and who knows, maybe even string theory. I didn't have time, but we also know more or less what are the requirements of this uh, three level correlator what requirements it should satisfy if it came from a weakly coupled string theory. So can we, we know the requirements, but we don't know if there is such an answer. So there are all sorts of amazing puzzles. There are of interest to real experiments, real surveys coming up in the next decade. They are connecting various different areas of uh, fundamental physics that uh, 
that uh, we know and love from string theory, from amplitudes, from the bootstrap and so on. So let me stop here. Sorry for going a bit over time and I'm happy to take more questions. Stay longer if you want to chat more, ask more about technicalities and so on. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Guy, for the very nice talk. Um, so are there any questions? Can I ask one quick question? Please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're describing this one over e squared pole. Uh, there, you know, the residue is like the amplitude, uh, which is no longer be restricted due to the two point function coefficient, uh, as you said, in the residue. So uh, one other thing, uh, if I understood correctly, given the flat shell amplitude, you would be able to construct the uh, amplitude in the DS, right? That, that's what you are describing, right? Yeah. Now, uh, for that one over e square pole, uh, I need to know for DS calculation or you know CFT calculation, I need to do, know the Watt Takasi identity, right? And uh, just given, we, suppose I don't know the Watt Takasi identity, uh, how, how am I actually able to uh, get, get the correlator? Um. <laughs> Well, for external scalars, there's no problem, but okay. So if you have external gravitons, what happens, the, the word Takahashi identity is, uh, is uh, kind of hidden there. So even though you're contracting your uh, external gravitons with polarization tensors, the word Takahashi identity is still there because there's a very subtle breaking of boost symmetry. Uh, because of this uh, dotting of uh, the polarization vectors with the graviton, and uh, if you don't, if you don't know the word identity, I think you will you will find that uh, if you try to if you try to look for a solution with uh, e total. Yeah, one thing I didn't mention, but I, I imagine you're you're aware is that the power in e total uh, can change. And for various powers of E total, I'm probing different degrees of irrelevance of the interaction. Uh, and the more, the more, uh, the higher the power, the more irrelevant. But then as I lower the power, if I'm probing these uh, very uh, um, relevant or, or marginal interactions, uh, naively you will fail at finding the correlator. But this failure, is uh, if you if you hit the resulting correlator with the boost um, operator, you will see that the failure is such that there is no e total singularity left over. So that's already telling you that there is still something interesting and special. So in other words, I, I have some I have something with um, this e total squared. As you said e left. Da, 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 you write with some numerator. Now I, I hit it with one of the Decida isometries, which is the boost operator. Then what you find that is no zero. It's no zero, but but in fact it has only e left, e right. It kills off the e total. Okay, and some stuff. And uh, I mean I think I see that this is a hint because it's telling you. That if you were to probe the flat space limit, you would be boosting variance. But in the Sitter space, there is some very subtle breaking of a boost symmetry. That uh, now I, I don't know how to I I don't know how you would be able to figure out that this is related to word identity without writing down the word identity. But I also don't see why you can you can always write the word identity because it's it's a consequence of very general principles, right? You're just uh, demanding that you're propagating the right number of degrees of freedom. You don't need to input the bulk action or anything like that. No, I, I agree that, you know, uh, what identity I can just write down based on symmetries. But right. I, I was a little curious because, as you said, the left hand side N, if it is a, just a scattering amplitude, that doesn't know about the Watt Takasi identity. But yeah. somehow the K kappa or the K, whatever, that knows about the Watt Takasi identity. 
yeah and somehow you are able to generate it just using you know uh, which is which does not has any connection to the what takashi are into you know or uh, yeah 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 i mean technically yeah it's a bit of a miracle to me also but technically what happens is that if i have a, a psi dotted onto some gamma operator uh, technically what happens is that the boost operator also hits the polarization vector and will generate uh, you know like a psi boost acting on the on the graviton which should be zero plus uh some stuff that is proportional to k dot gamma which we know is a, is the longitudinal is a longitudinal term that we need to know what it is from the word takashi identity but again there's no contradiction with flat space because the right hand side doesn't have one over e total hmm. so then there's no flat space limit to probe uh, but I, I agree with you. I mean, this shouldn't care about um, about the longitudinal mode, and yet it does. I mean, it's related to these uh, soft limits of cosmological correlators. One way of deriving them is uh, from uh, exploiting word identities that, again, are all about the longitudinal terms. Even though we're... I think what happens is that when you probe the very soft limits, uh, talking about the longitudinal term and talking about the uh, transverse polarization vector becomes a bit degenerate. Uh, that's why you still see a hint of the longitudinal piece in this limit. But um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions? So yeah, I had a question. Please. Yes. So, uh, yeah, one very basic question is, uh, are, are loop effects uh, observable in cosmology for the kind of correlators you are discussing? Right. And, and the other related question is, uh, the approach that you have uh, put forth here uh, using symmetries and analyticity and uh, singularities, can that be used for calculating uh, loops? Because I guess once you take this beyond loops, you probably don't expect mirror morphy, right? You can, can you get... Ah. Branch cuts and so on. Right, right. Well, as I said, I was very impressionistic. Even even tree level has branch cuts because the, the branch cut is coming from the spontaneous particle production. Yeah, I mean, technically speaking, all of these singularities are, are power law times a log. So they all have cuts. Okay. They are meromorphic in the case where everyone is light. So if, if the particle involved in the process here is is massless or, or or in the complementary series then it's a metamorphic but uh, for the run of the mu example of a massive scalar or a massive spinning field even three level uh, cosmological correlators have cuts so it's a yeah maybe one way to think about it is that cosmolog three level cosmological correlators are kind of like one loop scattering amplitudes in terms of the transcendentality degree they have dialogues, like things that you typically see in uh, in loop level, one loop scattering amplitudes. Now as to your question of are loops uh, observable in practice? I think the answer is yes. Um, people have investigated having fermions running in the loop, like standard model fermions. If you have like a, if the inflat on some sort of axion, maybe the key, yeah, to the QCD axion, you couple it to the top uh, quark. Uh, I think there are ways of uh, enhancing. So you would look at a diagram that uh, looks uh, something, that looks something like this. Uh, let me just draw three legs because we're breaking the sitter symmetry anyway so yeah some something like this the fermion running in the loop i i think that these uh, diagrams are interesting they will typically leave um they will not leave the, uh, the uh, one unfortunate thing is that a pair of fermions behaves if you use, uh, if you think in terms of a uh, Charlie Lehman, if you try to break the loop into a sum of trees, you'll see that the pair of fermions tends to behave like a sum of uh, heavier scalars. So they will not leave these uh, long tails that I was describing here earlier. 
they behave more like uh, they behave closer to the white curve than they behave to either the the orange and the blue curve. It's a bit harder to detect the feature of the fermion in the real world, but I think that they will leave interesting imprints and their the overall size I think is detectable. That's the phenomenology part. Now for the classification, that's something I'm actively working on. So for example, is there the bubble triangle box decomposition of one loop uh, uh, amplitudes? Is there something analogous for cosmological correlators? Can we write down like some master integral and understand its singularities, the general structure? I think the answer is yes. And, uh, but uh, yeah, we're not there yet. So I think uh, maybe if you ask me again in a year, uh, we'll have a full understanding of the structure at one loop. Now there are cases in which all loops contributes, but it's because you're expanding, in some sense, expanding around the wrong saddle, which is this Tarobinsky inflation type of scenario, in which the scalar field fluctuates so much that uh, it's moving away from. If I try to, uh, if I try to describe like some uh, very light scalar with lambda phi to the fourth, then uh, if you try to expand um, the potentials of lambda phi to the fourth, if you, if you try to expand the fluctuations around phi equals zero, you see that you get infrared divergences, but it's because the the phi ha wants to have fluctuations order h it fluctuates very efficiently so there is really some more non-trivial saddle around phi equals h around which the the scalar field is uh, is uh, jittering around and this is what this Starobinsky formalism is supposed to do for you and uh, but i don't know uh, it's kind of a all loop resummation of something I don't think people understand in detail uh, what's happening to the loop diagrams here that send you to this new saddle over there. Uh, that's, a, I think, a harder problem. But more, uh, yeah, just more systematically classifying things at one loop is something that I'm actually thinking about, and I think it's within reach. Sorry, but isn't the tree level already uh, difficult to observe in this case? So uh, yes, it is difficult to observe in the sky, but uh, uh, I mean, if I have a standard model fermions, they would only couple, uh, or, or even the Higgs, uh, if the inflaton is a, is a standard model uh, singlet, you can still write, uh, you can still write couplings of this form to the Higgs, the inflaton. So you could try, you can think of a scenario in which uh, the standard model couples to the inflaton. And uh, while we don't, we haven't observed anything, so they're still fairly loose bounds. So in principle, you could observe this with uh, new surveys and so on. So you, yeah, and you was, could have a scenario in which you would see all the standard model fields uh, running on loops in the sky. Uh, if you have three level couplings, you would have to be of the inflaton to new species that are not in the standard model. That's why loops are also interesting. But so I was wondering, so more generally, um, could you could you say a few words about uh, like the exp experimental prospects in the near future to observe like just non right. Sure. Yeah. The the I mean, people typically talk about um, three shapes. As I showed you, there is like infinitely many, but um, people usually boil down to three different shapes. Shape one is the shape coming from self interactions. Uh, that I think would be like uh, the one that peaks around the equilateral. Equilateral is much bigger than squeezed. Then there's a, there, there's another shape of self-interaction that you tune the various... Um, yeah, you just tune the self-interactions in such a way. It's just a convenient way of parametrizing. Um, parametrizing the interactions in such a way that you have um, the signal peaks actually around this uh, folded limit in which the triangle looks like this. It's not squeezed. Uh, it's kind of like take an isosceles triangle and try to, to fold it like a hat. Uh, so we call this uh, the folded limit. 
because it's like the collinear. You're like taking the collinear limit. Um, so this is called equilateral non-Gaussianity. This is uh, for kind of uh, reasons that will become clear in a second. It's called orthogonal because it's neither equilateral nor the third shape. The third shape is um, is the one in which I have um, is the extreme case of this exchange interaction in which the exchange the particle is massless. So I have an extra massless field that uh, that generates some long range interaction. And in these limits, actually, I do have signal. So I parameterize the shape in such a way that it's the inverted hierarchy. I have more signal around the squeeze limit than I do around the equilateral limit. So this is called local non-Gaussianity. It's called, even though it's the most non-local thing you can think of in inflation, because you have a very long range uh, mediator, it's called local because in terms of the density field here, uh, it's coming from some local rewriting of a Gaussian random field. So it's very confusing because it's, uh, it's as non-local as it gets from the point of view of inflation, but from the point of view of something that you do here, uh, the hot big bang, it's local. It's like taking your Gaussian random field, zeta Gaussian, and adding some piece zeta Gaussian squared and saying that this is the field that we actually observe in the sky. So when you compute the three-point function, there will be a contribution coming from the four-point function of this Gaussian random field. But uh, yeah, I mean, you need some, some uh, special type of scenario to generate this uh, shape here. I would say that it's the shape that uh, requires the most work to generate. This one is the easiest to generate. Any inflationary model with self-interaction will generate this shape. This one, you need uh, different scenarios, OK? Now, unfortunately, this one is the easiest to measure. This one is the hardest to measure. Uh, yeah, by the way, this is called orthogonal because it's in between these two shapes. These are the two shapes that were historically the first to be looked at. Um, okay, very good. So in terms of observability, I think we're, con we're going to continue to do better here. This is going to improve. So right now, uh, there's some figure, it doesn't matter. It's called FNL, it's called, that quantifies the size of the three-point function. And uh, right now, FNL local is bound to be less than around five. This FNL orthogonal, is bound to be less than order, um, I guess, 20. And this FNL equilateral is bound to be less than order 50. Uh, these numbers look huge, but actually this is highly Gaussian, OK? It's because of the way that this uh, parameter is defined. Uh, you should think of this as a 10 to the minus a bit. Um, the way it's parameterized, you get these big numbers, but it's quite Gaussian. Uh, but FNL local, I think we're going to get to order one, order one. The goal is to get order one in all of these. Because if it's less than order one, then uh, for sure the other fields that are active during inflation are not light, are not very light. And the uh, inflaton self interacts very weakly. It's probably very well described by weakly coupled. Uh, weakly coupled effective field theory. So now this, I think, is realistic. We're, we're probably going to get to order one in the near future. Now, these ones here uh, are much harder. And uh, they're upcoming large-scale structure surveys, in particular, one called SphereX, that uh, one of the main science goals is to try to measure something in between in between local and equilateral. As I said, there's this whole universe of shapes in between. Equilateral is the extreme limit of self-interactions, much harder to measure than local, in which you have this very light scalar mediating the interaction. And SphereX is going to either measure local 
with high significance, or you can measure, I don't know, some light-ish mediator, uh, but not, might not be so good at, at doing better with equilateral. How much better you can do with the equilateral and the orthogonal shape? Uh, with the CMB, I think it's hard, maybe by a factor of a few with new CMB experiments. With large scale structure, uh, it's a topic of active investigation. Uh, just because the universe is much older at uh, the time of large scale structure formation. So you need to do more work to, to extract the primordial signal. Uh, so these are the targets. This I think is feasible in the near future. This, depending on who you ask, we're going to do better, but if it's a factor of two, if it's a factor of 10, uh, it's still a matter of debate. Yeah. Okay, so now for the, these, for the last, last thing I'll say is uh, these shapes, they have features. Huh? They have these wiggly features of mass, wiggly features of spin. And uh, these, I don't think there has been a very systematic study of how well we can constrain the features because uh, it's much easier to find a signal with a feature than a boring signal with some power law. So we might be able to do better uh, at constraining these uh, signals with features, but uh, uh, again, it requires some some work to model the late universe and how you go from the probe back to the primordial signal and so on. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, sure, sure. Good for you. Uh, I was just wondering so about this uh, four point function, p level four point function result that you you mentioned. So in in D -sitter, uh also these uh, partially massless fields which you get when you have uh, uh, once you have spinning fields yes. you can have these partially massless fields of various tips so um, the statement that you can use this uh, uh, seed correlator of confirmably coupled scalars and then have these weight shifting operators so using that can you generate a four point function of uh, partially massless field also that is one part. And the other is, uh, yes. do we know the basic structure of these correlators? Like, uh, if I remember correctly, they do not exist, for example, in the flat space uh, limit. So if one looks at the residue uh, of a particular singularity, what, what will you get there for such a correlator, if that makes sense? Right. Yeah. So yeah, the answer to the first question is yes, you can get the, you can use weight shifting operators to get a partially massless field correlators. And when you take the flat space limit, you just see the highest helicity mode. So there's no contradiction. You just see like a, if it's partially massless spin two, for example, it could be the graviton or the field of mass or the Hubble that is partially massless, but you only see graviton exchange in the flat space limits. Now, uh, what we think happens, and there are some partial results by uh, Slate, Tarona, and uh, we also have like some uh, partial results, but there is no theorem that if you put these partially massless fields on the external legs, you will fail at uh, finding a four-point correlator that is consistent with the water density. If you have external scalar probes, there is no issue with exchanging a partially massless field, and you can compute it using weight shifting operators. But I think that there there is no consistent, to my knowledge, known uh, four-point correlator with external partially massless fields, unless it's the graviton. Uh, well, so you will you write down the, the word identity, and uh, what happens is if you if you weight shift and land at that point, you'll see that just the S channel will not saturate the word identity. Uh, and then you see, oh, can I go to other channels to see if I can fix the word identity? And there is only two other channels to go to. You can go to the T channel, you can go to the U channel. You can try to add self-interactions. And uh, for example, for gravity, that's how you see the equivalence principle. Yes. Uh, but but uh, if you try to do that for partially massless fields, the claim is that you will fail. Even if you go to the T and U channel, and try to add other stuff, you still can't fix the word identity. But, there is no, I have to say that there is no fully systematic study of this, and it would be very nice to completely fix this, uh, fix this issue. Just uh, be able to show that at three level, 
all possible correlators are classified and they are for massless fields and they're either gauge theory or gravity or uh, for example uh, if I have uh, the gravitino right uh, if you try to go to the massless limits where you would have uh, some hope of finding a super gravity you should see that you're bound to fail for finding a consistent cosmological correlator because there can't be linear SUSY in the sitter space but again th this is this is all things that we expect uh, but but it hasn't been done thank you um i was also wondering about uh, so, so you mentioned uh, uh, doing the same thing for like a general fl FLRW cosmology. Uh -huh. So could you say a few words about this? And also sure, sure. This? Yeah, this is the rabbit hole I'm, I'm currently in. So okay. let me describe to you. So here's the, the, the simplest, the simplest correlator that um, so in the CDR space, if I have, so this is a toy mod is not realistic, but I, but I think it has a lesson. So if I have conformally coupled scalars everywhere, Okay, so this is just the same scalar everywhere. This is phi cubed, which is the only cubic interaction you can have in the sitter. K1, K4. Uh, the four-point function is given by this formula. The four-point function is given by this formula, integral. And I'm going to write in an integral representation for reasons that will become clear in a second. x1 plus x2 plus um, k1 2 plus k3 4 x1 plus k1 2 plus s x2 plus k3 4 plus s um, integral from 0 to infinity so that's why I said it's kind of impressionistic what I was showing before uh, so you need to actually, if you if you set the integration variables to zero, this is literally the the wave function of the universe, but in flat space, not in the sitter. So if I computed the cosmological correlator, but in flat space, if I just take uh, time equals zero as a time slice, and uh, I have a massless scalar in flat space self interacting and I want to compute the equal time expectation value, it's not a scattering amplitude, at t equals zero, uh, I will get this irrational function that I wrote here when I set these uh, two variables to zero, okay? Uh, but in the sitter space, you can, in, in the sitter space, you can just, uh, you can just integrate, uh, and you, it's, a, it's a die logarithm, okay? Now, uh, one, one interesting thing that happens is that, uh, is that if I want to do the same, want to do the same diagram in FRW cosmology, it's the same integrands, but now there's an epsilon here, okay? And epsilon equals zero is a decider, okay? And uh, if I have FRW, FL, RW, the scale factor goes like eta to the epsilon over eta. Okay, so that when epsilon goes to zero, I get the sitter space. Um, now the question is, can I bootstrap this? Um, this is a bulk representation, okay? Secretly, these x1 and x2 variables are the times. Not quite, but they are kind of like the time, the time integral. Now the question is, can I bootstrap this? In other words, can I find uh, a differential equation or some consistency requirement on this integral that uh, that uh, gives me the four-point function, but in FRW cosmology? And the answer is yes. And um, and there is a beautiful theory of. Uh, um, generalized uh, hypergeometric functions and so on uh, that that tells me because I'm essentially integrating I'm essentially integrating a rational function times this uh, funny um, times this funny factor here there's a whole theory of integration of um, 
rational functions with a little twist and this twist is what this um what this power is doing that allows me to find the differential equation satisfied by this uh, four point function uh and uh, that that's uh, that's what i'm currently investigating so what happens is uh you get a differential equation uh that, that i mean i could write it for you but it's a second order differential equation that is not tied to symmetry which is kind of um, surprising to me but uh anyway it allows you to bootstrap uh, frw cosmology so but so is there like a phenomenological motivation for this because if in inflation should be approximately the theta right yeah but for example if you want to study a uh, systematic deviation for from the sitter space or there are some scenarios of inflation in which there's like rapid turns so there are certain uh, periods of inflation in which it's not exactly the sitter space so this is just a stepping stone trying to understand okay, is it all tied to symmetry right or is the, or is there uh, something that you can say more generally uh, so this is just a time model in which you can say something much more general so it's not realistic because everything is conformally coupled everything gets diluted but um, i think the lesson here is that a lot of these uh, bootstrappy things of finding a differential equation that only depends on boundary data and so on uh, are applicable way beyond the approximate the sitter scenario i mean the the more lowbrow thing that you could do that's already interesting is you can study deviations from the sitter systematically so you can study the small epsilon limits of this differential equation because we do expect certain deviation from the exact the sitter limits but i think it's more general i mean for example uh, you could even try to apply this formalism to study alternatives to inflation so famously the universe very slowly contracts which is a totally different type of uh, power law cosmology uh, it, it can accommodate two-point function that is compatible with scaling variance or almost scaling variance but we think that the non-gaussianities will be very different so maybe this formalism will be applicable to that scenario so i think that it's uh, um, from the mathematical physics perspective, I think it's very interesting because it's, it ties to a whole literature in loop scattering amplitudes. Uh, this epsilon here plays a role of the Jim Rag parameter in flat space scattering amplitudes. And uh, for different reasons, people have developed the theory of how to find differential equations for loop amplitudes. We can import all the formalism to these uh, three level processes, but in FRW cosmologies. But I think that there will be interesting phenomenological applications. Another thing is the moment that you're away from the sitter, you have infinitely many vertices. So in the cubic vertex just goes haywire. There are infinitely many possible cubic self-interactions. But it turns out that it's just related to dialing these uh, powers here downstairs to various integers. And if you, it's very useful to change perspective and think of this theory of the integrals of rational functions, because if you understand one example, again, you understand all of them. There are some simple, it's related to what people call the contiguous relation of the hypergeometric function. There is, there is an infinite series of re, linear relations between the various members of these bases of functions for, for different values of these um, exponents here. Uh, so, again, even though you're in FRW cosmology and there are infinitely many interaction vertices, I find it amazing that you still have control over the whole setup. But I agree with you that phenomenologically it's not as immediate as uh, studying other things. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, yeah, so if not, actually, I don't know if you have time, but if you have a minute, maybe also you, you could, uh, do you mind saying a few words about another thing in the abstract, which was uh, this spinning correlators 
and gravitational waves? Or? Yes. Yeah, just, uh, just uh, I mean, it was related to a, a question asked during the talk. So what happens is that um, if I if I if I try if I have a spinning correlator, I have the graviton. Let's take one graviton for example, one graviton and two scalars. Okay, one graviton, two scalars, and I. This is the simplest example in which this phenomenon happens. Um, now I study this three-point function. This three-point function, I need to pick a polarization for the graviton. So then, what I do is uh, um, I contract oops, uh, j gamma j k one phi of k two phi of k three. And this machinery of weight shifting operators will give me will give me uh, uh, an object. So this is equal to some weight shifting operator acting on the scalar three point function. There is no problem. We know how to write down. But but what this what this will really give what this really gives is some tensor. Let me call it B I J with um, weight, with the right conformal weight, which in this case is conformal weight three and spin two, uh, and then scalars, uh, weight three, for example, if they're massless. So it's just something that satisfies the, the correct, uh, uh, the correct uh, uh, condition on the primary operator, but you see, uh, this is a short multiplet. It propagates uh, less degrees of freedom. So you you also have to check that if it's uh, if it's if it has these quantum numbers, it's it's actually the stress tensor, right? In terms of conformal field theory, phi phi. So in other words, you need to check that the the stress tensor is, is conserved. So this is another requirement that you should check. Okay. And inside of a correlation function, it implies some wire identity that is conserved up to delta function things. Okay. So what happens is that if you you get this object, but now you have to contract it with the polarization tensor, and then you check you try to act on it with the boost operator. And uh, it's a it's a famous fact, but I think a bit underappreciated, the polarization vectors are not Lorentz vectors they actually change by a gauge transformation right when you do a Lorentz boost so when you apply a boost to it you won't get the same result you will get the same result up to a longitudinal term k1 k1 i gamma i j phi phi and this is fixed by a word identity okay so that's the requirement so because because you're contracting because you're contracting your your uh, external would be graviton with a polarization vector there's some naive violation of Lorentz invariance and the only way to or the sitter invariance here and the only way to keep things consistent with full the sitter invariance is to tune certain coefficients so here you discover that the size of this three-point function you can't dial the coefficient at will. It's determined by the size of the two-point function of the scalar. So if you dial the two-point function of the scalar, it's called C, you need the same C here, which is uh, related to the equivalence principle. It's because in the bulk, it's really coming from the kinetic term of the scalar. When you expand it out, expand it out you have gamma dotted onto the kinetic term. So that's uh, how you bootstrap things like the equivalence principle. So if you try to have a S channel diagram with an external graviton, you see that it, it will only be consistent if the graviton couples to all the legs with equal strength and so on. It's because of this uh, subtle breaking of the Sitter symmetry that it can only be fixed if you tune certain coefficients in a way consistent with uh, with uh, the equivalence principle. You can even do it for external gauge fields and you can discover uh, charge conservation or the structure of young Mills theory and so on. So that's what happens.
I see. Thanks. Um, so, any more question for for him? It's been yeah, it's already late. Um, okay, if not, um, thank you, let's give for the nice talk and the discussion. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thanks again for having me. Um, sure. Thanks for the, the ones that uh, survived till the end. <laughs> I hope it was yes. fun. And, uh, well, good to see you, Victor. And, um, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. So let me end the meeting now. Bye. Bye bye.